How to Deal When the Shit Gets Real podcast. I'm Rietta, and today I'm here with Karen Malkin Lazarevich. I hope I said it right. Yes, I did. You did. <laughs> so, Karen, tell us how do you deal when the shit gets real, or just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I usually just fake it till I make it when the shit gets real, but um, a little bit uh, about myself. I am 50 years young, and um, I'm a mom, I'm a wife. And 15 years ago, I decided to remove my healthy breasts and ovaries to reduce my risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer due to a family history. And so now I talk all things boobs and tubes and all tattoos. <laughs> Dude, that needs to be a t-shirt. I know. And I just thought of it on the spot. <laughs> There you go. There's your next endeavor. Make boobs, tubes, and tattoos. tattoos. I'd buy one. Right? I would too. <laughs> well, see, look at we already say we're a minute in and we already got a business idea. I'm look thinking. at that. I love it. <laughs> love it. All right. So let's since we we talked about boobs already. So yep. you found out that not your mom, but your dad had the BRCA yeah. gene, which to me was interesting. And I guess I just never really thought about it being on the paternal side, but it really makes sense that it could happen either way. But can you break that down first? Is there a difference? Is it just family history period? The way that it works is with hereditary cancer mutations, uh, you have a chance of inheriting from both sides of your family because you get 50% of your genetics from your mom and 50% from your dad. And because breast cancer can be on both sides of the family, you know, we always associate breast cancer in men, which does happen. And there are men who develop breast cancer, although it is more rare, but you know, we weren't even speaking about my dad. We were talking about my paternal grandmother, my paternal aunt, my paternal cousins. And so, um, through our family history and through one of my cousins being diagnosed with ovarian cancer, um, they let us know <clears throat> that there's a blood test you can get in order to find out if you carry this mutation. And so that's sort of how my story began um, with this hereditary cancer mutation, which I can tell you more about if you're interested. Um, because Absolutely. a lot of people don't know about it. And the first and most important thing is that it's five to 10% of the population. So it's not meant to strike fear in people, but it's why it's so important to know your family history. So the way I describe it is all of us carry a BRCA gene, whether we're male or female. The, um, the goal of that gene, that BRCA gene, is to fight off tumors that enter in certain parts of the body, whether you're male or female. So in females, it's breasts, ovaries, this mutation also puts you at higher risk for prostate cancer, uh, melanoma, and in men, it puts you at higher risk for male breast cancer and prostate cancer. So these tumors enter our body and this BRCA gene, what ends up happening is it fights off the tumors. When you have a BRCA mutation, that gene is broken. So the tumors that enter in can't be fought back by that link in your DNA. And so you have a higher risk of developing cancer because your body can't fight off the tumors that are created in your body. Gotcha. Okay. That all makes sense. Yeah. And just for a further connection. So yes. if it's in your gene, mm -hmm. how does removing everything kind of cancel out that gene? If that makes so, sense. It's a great question. Now they don't usually recommend this for men and I don't know all the facts. I do know part of it is because there's not a lot of male breast tissue. So it's much easier to screen. So if you find out you carry this mutation, you don't have a lot of options, but if you remove your breasts prior to actually having a cancer diagnosis, there is nowhere for those tumors to enter when you're BRCA gene is broken. So while the tumors are entering, there's no tissue or there's minimal tissue in those high risk areas. So that's why they can't say it's, you know, I didn't decrease my risk by 100%, but I've decreased it more than the general public because I have such minimal amount of breast tissue left, if that makes sense. No, that totally makes sense. And I assume that also goes, since you said you had a hysterectomy and all that as well, that also applies. Exactly. And again, it doesn't decrease my risk to zero because there's still tissue 
in your body. We can't remove everything, but my goal was to do my due diligence to make sure that I didn't get cancer because when I looked at my dad's side of the family, so many of my family members died from that mutation. Oh my goodness. That's yeah. probably kind of scary just to see how it's kind of gone down the line. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I have no regrets with what I did, um, but it's not for everybody. And it doesn't mean if you carry this mutation that you have to rush to remove healthy body parts. You know, there is surveillance and screening. A lot of women are finding out at a younger age. And, you know, I, I feel blessed that I was able to have my children and I was able to nurse them. And I didn't have to deal with all of these decisions prior to starting a family. But with knowledge and more information, the next generations are finding out earlier. Which is good. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I did actually interview another gal whose sister had the BRCA gene as well, and she did the mm -hmm. removal. And the thing that I found really fascinating that I did not know before is that you actually, that includes the nipple. Like I was like, oh, I mean, it makes sense. It's breast tissue. So exactly. Did, did you do the whole shebang too? I did. So thankfully technology and medical um, advancements have really gotten better. Uh, my original mastectomy was done 15 years ago. At that time, I didn't even have an option to keep my nipples because there's a risk of breast cancer in the milk ducts. So that's why you're removing the breasts, uh, the nipples and areolas. Nowadays, um, even breast cancer patients, depending on where the breast cancer is, are sometimes given the option of saving their nipples. It's called nipple sparing. And so they actually hollow out the nipple and then you can put your lipstick in there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Humor is how to handle when I shit gets it. real. <laughs> I appreciate it. I love it. <laughs> um, so they hollow out the nipple and then they observe it. Sometimes it heals properly and other times it doesn't. So they haven't perfected it yet, which is why I think a lot of women choose to remove their nipples and areolas. Um, but it's really, it, it's nice to know that they're making, they're taking those next steps yeah. in order to try to preserve the nipple. Absolutely. Yeah. So was your, I know you said your dad found out. So was your dad diagnosed with cancer? Did he catch it soon enough? Did he, or did he like test with you? So he tested, I would say like two months before me, 15 years ago. And um, he lost his mother and his aunt and his cousin. His brother has melanoma, but so far he's doing okay. And, you know, in my mind, I always thought, yeah, this is good. My dad, he's been healthy, but no, he developed uh, prostate cancer um, and he passed away eight months ago. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, but I... You know, he, he gave me this knowledge and this information, and now I'm creating a legacy. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with the decisions he made in order to be brave enough to take that step 15 years ago, especially being a man, and um, giving me the information that allowed me to make decisions to stay healthy. So, yeah, it affected male and female on my paternal, on my paternal side. I love that you decided to take a positive outlook at it though. I mean, that's, that's super important. And yeah, I, I can't imagine. I'm sure it was so hard to lose your dad, but I'm glad that you found a, a positive Avenue to look yeah. at it through. Yeah. And, you know, I think because we were quite close, especially at the end, I think it was, you know, he was my biggest supporter and his, you know, he was always making sure like he was that quiet, proud dad, but I know he was really happy with everything that I was doing. So kind of sounds like my dad, like quiet and knowledgeable, but like right. very loving in his own way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, so, I feel it. Um, that's it. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's sad. It was a hard year, but he didn't have those same options that I did. They don't they don't offer men removal of the prostate. It comes with so many more complications than removal of ovaries or removal of breasts. So they don't offer that for men. It's kind of a bummer, but you know, medical science has definitely made amazing advances. Maybe they'll, uh, maybe they'll figure it out. Exactly. Here's hoping. Here's hoping. Mm -hmm. um, so you obviously had your surgeries and yeah. 
I'm imagining they're both very major surgeries. How did they go? How did you feel? All the things. Um, so I think because I had my children and my husband, I had no regrets. And I remember, so I started with the hysterectomy first and I was only 33. So I remember telling my husband, how are you going to feel once I have a mustache? Because you go <laughs> right into menopause. <laughs> So I was like, so if I have a mustache and I'm really angry and cranky, are you still going to be okay? So we joked about it. Um, the surgery itself was, I think, not as difficult for me as it was for others. And that's because I was already, my family was complete. And so I never felt that losing my um, reproductive organs made me feel less than I never felt that. And there are some women who do, and there's no right way to feel. I just feel quite lucky that I didn't feel that mm -hmm. surgery was surgery. You know, it's not fun. Recovery sucks. My kids were again, two and four. So, Ooh, so I young. was, they were young and, you know, my biggest concern is how long until I can hold them again and get mm -hmm. back to normal. So it was laparoscopic. Um, and they removed all of my reproductive organs. I chose that. I could have just removed my ovaries and fallopian tubes, but I chose uh, to remove everything uh, because they don't know. They're always learning more about these mutations. I don't want to hear in 10 years, well, there's also a risk of, you know, uterine cancer. So figured I didn't need them and I removed them. The surgery was successful, but I did go right into menopause and although I joke about having a mustache, which I didn't get, by the way. Um, you know, it comes along with a lot of physical changes. So you go into menopause. So you're dealing with maybe anxiety, maybe depression, maybe um, issues with libido, uh, you know, dry skin, memory loss. Like there are so many things that we don't Hot think flashes. of. Right? Hot flashes. Like you just don't think about it. So I took it as it came. I, you know, thankfully I didn't deal with depression, but I, you know, I've noticed anxiety. So I went on to a mild anti-anxiety pill. My libido changed a little bit. Um, I kind of say instead of now always having a higher libido, it's sort of like going to the gym. Nobody wants to like put on their shoes and put their sweats on and, get in the car and drive to the gym and pick your equipment. But when you're done with your workouts, you're like, whoa, why didn't I wait? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, libido has changed, but I've chosen to not make that a part of my everyday issue. And so that's okay. Uh, hot flashes are terrible, but manageable. And at the end of the day, menopause is not going to kill me. Ovarian cancer would. And I just always keep that, like, I don't allow myself to have regrets. I don't have regrets. But what's the point of doing these surgeries if I'm going to be miserable with my decisions? Right. Absolutely. So, so the hysterectomy was relatively easy. And I use that term loosely. It's not for everybody. The mastectomy is harder because you're waking up without breasts and you're losing an intimate part of your physical being. So... I had a really hard time looking in the mirror at the beginning. And, you know, nowadays, if you undergo a double mastectomy, they can do direct implants, they can do direct reconstruction. But I didn't have that choice at the time. So I had to have like delayed reconstruction. So you wake up feeling, you know, first of all, flat and not comfortable in your skin. So that was a little bit harder emotionally, more with how I looked, not so much with my decisions. Sorry, I was just like letting all that like processed. Um, I know. I, that's why I, I wanted to take a break because I know for me, you know, it's a lived experience now, but, I, I, you know, it, it's not something easy to wake out without wake up without your breasts, without your tissue, without your nipples. You have, you know, drains. You just lost a part of who you are. Yeah. And that's what I was just trying to imagine because we do, I think most of us associate our breasts with a sort of femininity and what of makes course. us feminine, no matter the size, big, small, whatever. Exactly. We all have them. So I definitely could see having like an identity crisis almost. Yep. It, it's like the way I described it is that 
you have to allow yourself to mourn your loss. You, you yeah. have to, you have to lean into it because you have to s- look at yourself differently. And, and the other thing too, it's not just, we see them as our identity and femininity, but for a lot of women, they're erogenous zones as well. Oh yeah, so, absolutely. And I'm you know, sure that if you enjoy your nipples being played with and then, Oh, where are they? Well, <laughs> You well, know. and I'm sure intimacy in general was probably a different ball game. Like, like you already said, libido was lower. Now yeah. you don't feel as sexually feminine or sexually attractive. So I'm sure was, was that probably a hurdle as well? Um, so I always joke with my husband. We're like, thank, am I allowed to curse? Oh, absolutely. You saw He's the like, title. I know. I just had to make sure he, I'm like, <laughs> thank God you're an ass man. He's like, yep. We don't need any tips. So we, you know, we kind of tried to joke about it even to this day. Like when we're intimate, sometimes he'll like go to reach for my chest and then he'll pull down. I'm like, you can touch if you want to just know that I don't feel anything. So like motorboat away. I mean, no, but I mean, pretend. right, exactly. But I mean, all kidding aside for, I was quite lucky that my breasts were never a real erogenous zone. Um, so I didn't lose that part of it, but you do lose a part of how you feel, you know, in your clothes. And I always had larger breasts. So that in itself, going from large boobs to like nothing for a while, was a bit of a mind fuck. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. And I was 33. Yeah. So you were still, I still consider that your prime. You were still very, you like, you were married, you had young kids. Like, I mean, I'm 38. So I'll, Right. I still feel like I'm in my prime. So that's it. And yeah. then, I, and then there were those other questions like, you know, my son was four and I remember talking and my daughter was two. And I remember saying to my husband at one time, like, I'm going to need to tell him what nipples are. Cause like one day he's going to like go to second base and like come running home going, mom, there's she had these growths on her. Like we would joke about it a little bit, like to normalize it, you know? I so, mean, valid things point. You don't, right. <laughs> Or like things like, you know, when do you start telling your kids about your period? And there was never any pads or tampons after they were four. So I was very conscious of all of this. So I would buy pads and tampons and like put them behind the toilet so that that conversation would spark. You know, it was always thinking of these little things. So it wasn't only that I lost a little bit of who I am, but you have to kind of adapt a little bit in order to see things a little bit differently. You know, you don't always plan. Your life doesn't always work out the way that you expect it to. And so you have to kind of pivot and take a turn. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, You had mentioned too in your pre-interview that there was some complications. So what happened with that? Yeah. So, um, and it's not an art form. I'd like to say that, you know, surgeons are just people and they're doing their best. I had problems with one implant just not staying within the pocket of my chest. So it would slip out of the pocket and slowly migrate down my chest. So I started calling it my knee pad (laughs) because it just, you know, kept on slipping down. Um, But it was creating pain, right? Because it it was in a place. Yeah, it was in a place it didn't belong. Exactly. So I ended up going for, you know, three more corrective surgeries. And finally, that plastic surgeon was like, well, they look good. And I'm like, dude, you're you're not doing anything differently. I'm in pain. And Mm -hmm. they're lopsided. And he said, well, you know, every woman is born with uh, one breast larger than the other. And I said, yes, but as a plastic surgeon, your goal isn't to mimic that. Yeah, it's to mimic the men. Exactly. And then I burst into tears and my husband was there and um, I said, give me a referral to another plastic surgeon. So it's not that I thought this surgeon was terrible. It's that he didn't know when to say, I can't do anything else. I'll pass you on to someone else. Mm -hmm. So after numerous surgeries with him, I went to a brand new plastic surgeon who had to start over because there was so much scar tissue going on after the three surgeries I had had with this first plastic surgeon. And the second plastic surgeon went in, kind of started over, 
And he decided because my implant was sli slipping that they would put textured implants in. And they use those oftentimes for women who don't have any breasts because the textured implants actually grips to your skin and heals over it. So he put that in and for, you know, three years, everything was fine. And then I started having some issues. So I went back to him and had another complication. And a year after that, we started hearing some murmurings in the European world that there was these brand of implants, kid you not, textured implants that are known to cause a rare type of lymphoma. Oh, no. Who, who has those implants? Oh, no. You're doing I do. to avoid cancer. That's not. Yeah. <laughs> right. Talk about irony. So I started calling the surgeons and I was saying, you know, what are the risks? And it started with, you know, really minor risk. It was like really like one out of 30,000 people. But I, you know, I'm like a bloodhound when I get onto something. And so I started doing more research and I was starting to see that in Europe they had banned them and that the risk drop, you know, the risk of getting sick went from like one in 30,000 to one in 3,000. And then I started getting angry. So I did like the whole media circuit in Canada as much as I could talking about them. There was a whole group of us and we all ended up basically getting them, you know, with advocacy, they were taken off the markets, but I still had That's these good. toxic implants in my body. So the plastic surgeon that had repaired me after the first surgeon I loved, but he had gone private and you can understand how private health care is, you know, a pretty penny. And so then I had to find the whole new process again to find a surgeon, a plastic surgeon who was well versed in these toxic implants because they couldn't just be removed. They had to clean all inside my chest cavity to make oh sure goodness. that nothing was. Yeah. Thankfully, that was before COVID. And uh, I had a lot of support. And the funny thing is that. I told my husband when they first removed my nipples, don't let me quit without nipples. I'm going to ask for like an, like a left areola for like a Christmas bonus. And, you know, for my birthday, I'm going to ask for a right nipple. Like I was joking about it, but one surgery, then another surgery, another surgery. And at the time they were going to reconstruct the nipple with like a skin flap. And every time I had a surgery, I was just more discouraged with the thought of actually having to undergo another surgery to recreate a nipple that I would never feel and that would never work. And by then I had been looking in the mirror for so long that all of a sudden it just felt like normal to not see nipples. And so I stopped with surgery. I remember too, and this was even a while ago, that when uh, Ink Masters started doing tattoos on breast cancer survivors, and part of that was was making nipples out of tattoos, which I thought yep. was amazing. And they look so real. I know. And there's, an, uh, there's a few amazing artists in the U.S. Uh, one of them is in Maryland. One of them is in, I forget. When, I don't know, Richmond, but there are some really amazing artists. And that's, in my opinion, a much better option now, unless women really yeah. want to have the look of a nipple, because these three-dimensional nipple tattoos are like, they look so real. They and do. it gives these women a sense of feeling complete. But yeah. I figured, who wants a freaking picture of a nipple? Like, what a... Uh, I won't feel anything. It doesn't have anything. I'm not interested. So I yeah. kind of stopped with the whole nipple thing and I went the tattoo route instead, but not nipple tattoo. I went. See, there you artistic. go. So take us, take us on that route then. Yes. Yeah, so after all of these surgeries, I've always, I mean, as you can see, I have, you know, my arms are all covered with tattoos. I've always, right. Like always loved tattoos was always like that big rebel of the time who was getting them before everyone else. And um, I started thinking about it and I started Googling it. I think I got my tattoo like seven years ago and there wasn't a lot of women who were doing it and you couldn't see their faces. And so I just knew I was going to do it. And I started, as you do, you look at different art artists to see what you like. I knew I wanted floral and I knew I wanted something soft. I also knew I only wanted one side of my chest to be done because I kind of feel proud of what I've done. So when I look and see the scarring on my right side, I'm like, 
okay, that's where I started. And now look. Love that. I love right? that. So that's me. Most women like to cover both if they're going to do it at all. But I just wasn't interested in doing that. And so I looked around for, you know, an artist that I could connect with because for those people who don't have tattoos, it's quite a cathartic uh, thing to get a tattoo. You know, you have you have a connection with the artist and you're very vulnerable and it's, you know, it's it's a painful process at times. And so I just started speaking with artists and I met this one lovely young artist named Megan and we just connected. And she told me that her grandmother was a breast cancer survivor. So we worked together and she created this beautiful mastectomy tattoo. Um, and I had my husband come to see a little part of it and my kids just so they can be a part of that process. And when I looked in the mirror, after it was done, I realized this was the first time since my diagnosis that nobody was telling me what to do with my body. Nobody was telling me what treatment I needed, what surgery I needed, what plastic surgeon, what dietitian. Like, it was the first time I was able to take control without any healthcare professionals needing to provide input. And then when I looked in the mirror, I didn't see that constant reminder anymore of all the surgeries I had gone through. I saw this beautiful piece of art that I got to choose and I realized how healing it was and that you don't always need to have surgery in order to find a new sense and a new beginning from a breast cancer diagnosis or from a risk reducing double mastectomy. I love it. That's beautiful. So yeah. then you started um, Empower Inc. I did. So I was getting a lot of, you know, a lot of people were really interested in what I had done. And, you know, I started because I already had a large community. I've been doing health advocacy for like 15 years since I started this. And people were really interested in it. And I was ta I was talking with my tattoo artist. I said, you know, I really want to do something like this. I saw some idea about providing free tattoos somewhere in Colorado. So I tracked down the guy who had posted it and reached out to him and said, I love what you're doing. I just ended up getting a mastectomy tattoo myself. Um, and I love the idea of what you're doing, connecting breast cancer survivors with tattoo artists. Can I take the idea and bring it to Montreal? And he said, run with it. So for a few years, I worked with this uh, organization called Personal Inc. They're still in existence now. I shoot people their way. They shoot people me, my way. Um, and I worked with them for a few years, connecting breast cancer survivors with tattoo artists, and then realized the value of having a space in Canada where I can do this and run it my own way and have mm -hmm. a lot more freedom. So in 2022, I started Empower Inc. Because once you have are a part of this program, it's very empowering. And so what I do is three, four, sometimes five times a year, I host different days throughout Canada where breast cancer survivors, three, four, five, six at a time, come together in a tattoo shop and they're connected with a tattoo artist in the style that the recipient has requested. And that artist will create the tattoo of their dreams. And then they get that full tattoo on the day of the event with other breast cancer survivors. And I cater the day and we have champagne to begin and music. Aww. And it's a full celebration of love. And it's the first time they get to define beauty on their terms the way they want. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I love that so much. Um, you know, it's, it's so important to have freaking a awesome. <laughs> and I'm sure yeah. you've met and connected and remained friends or at least connected with all these amazing women. And what's amazing is because I've been doing this now for so long and I share a lot of videos on my Instagram of the reveals, you know, like the the ugly cries and the happy cries of looking in the mirror and seeing these new beginnings is that I've attracted people from all over North America. I have a day December 1st in Quebec City in Canada. We're going to be 12 women. It's my largest day so far. I have one lady coming from Texas. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Because I always say if if you can afford the tattoo, which generally ranges anywhere from, say, $1,000 to $2,000, 
Not everybody can, obviously. But if somebody who's, because I don't want to limit it to somebody who can't afford it. You know, whether right. you have money or you don't, it's not about that. It's about the experience. So I always say, if you have that money and you're willing to travel, use that money on the travel and come for the experience. Because you're surrounded with all these like-minded women and men. Because I have had a man who also was invited, uh, who was a breast cancer survivor. And he also got his, you know, scars covered. Uh, but to come for the experience, you know, to be surrounded by such positivity. Yeah. Well, that also answered that question because I was going to ask if, if part of the experience of the tattoo was covered, but it's it's not. So that's, I mean, it's still wonderful. Exactly. So, you know, if I have, for example, if I do an event in Toronto, I will tend to be able to bring in people, say, from like Buffalo, New York, um, because people can drive, right? Mm -hmm. So, um I had somebody drive in from the other side of Canada. I've had people from Washington, D.C., Missouri, you know. Um, so I just like to put the opportunity out there. And if they can make it, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so for people that do want to experience that or connect with you, how do they do that? So I am uh, everywhere. It is Empower Inc. So it's E-M-P-O-W-E-R-I-N-K, as in Tattoo Inc., dot ca that's my website um if anyone has any questions they can absolutely reach out to me i do have um a couple of spots open for december 1st in quebec city uh for a few more days and the application is on my website if you want to see really emotional reveals of people looking in the mirror post mastectomy i mean excuse me post tattoo you can check empower inc underscore ca on instagram and underscore CA on Facebook. Um, it's also, I think it's important in case you do get anybody who asks any questions, it is under no obligation that anybody needs to share their images on social media if they're invited to be a part of this program. We see so many women and breast cancer stories sharing everything that it does not mean that you need to. And people tend to not apply thinking that they have to share those images and they don't. The ones who oh, share want to share. And it's open reminder. to men as well. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Um, I think people think that a lot about like boudoir photography too. Like, oh yeah, exactly. you take these images and you have to share them. It's like, no, you don't. Yeah. That's that's Right? Okay. You're like, nobody is saying, great, I want these private pictures. Now share them with the world. No, of course. The ones who want to will and the ones who don't never need to. And I work really well with the artists. They understand that not everybody is going to share those images, that it's a private area on the body and it's totally their call. Awesome. Um, and I know you, we also briefly, and I love to talk about this too, because I work in healthcare myself. We briefly mentioned in the pre-interview um, dealing with healthcare and that you had um, tips and tricks and stuff for the, at least the Canadian healthcare system. Yep. So what can you share with people that might need the tips for dealing um, with the healthcare system? Well, I think the first thing that's important, and it's not even just for Canada, it's for the U.S. as well, as I have a lot of friends in the U.S., is that it's all right as a patient to get a second opinion. I think that's so important. People forget that it's our bodies and that we don't have to take the word of one person. You know, we go and buy a house and we get a second opinion and we buy a car and we get a second opinion and we try on a pair of pants and ask for a second opinion, but we never see that with ourselves. So I think that's really important that you are entitled to a second opinion. I also think it's really important when you go to a doctor's appointment that you come with questions prepared on a piece of paper, either with somebody who's able to sit with you and make sure that if you're missing something there or not, and to know that it's okay to ask the doctor if you can record it because you're overwhelmed and you're maybe missing something. There are some doctors that will say no, but many will surprise you and say yes. So those are really big points. Um, and I think the most important thing with healthcare, because I don't know exactly how it is in the US, but in Canada, we have Medicare. So our healthcare is paid for, which in theory is really wonderful, but you could wait 10 months to get an appointment somewhere, or maybe you don't have a family doctor. 
And so if that's the case, it's really important that you have to advocate for yourself. You either go into a private clinic and you ask them for something. You don't have to have a family doctor to get a referral. You just need to have an appointment with an actual doctor. Um, yeah. You know, and so that's really important. You have to sometimes not be shy to ask questions, especially when it comes to, you know, genetic testing or this breast cancer family history. You know, if you're wondering <clears throat> if you think you need to go for genetic testing, don't just walk into a doctor's office saying, hey, I need genetic testing. Look at your family histories. Look at the cancers in your family. Come with a little bit, like treat it a little bit as a business meeting because doctors feel they're already so pressed for time, at least if you come prepared, they're more willing to answer. Um, and to know that there's always going to be doctors out there that you're not going to like, but it doesn't define the whole medical system. Yeah, that's super important because I think yeah. some people do sometimes get caught up in, oh, this doctor didn't care about me. And that may be the case, but that doesn't mean the next one. Will exactly. Be the same. Exactly. And I think that, you know, it's okay to know that you don't always have to know what you're doing when you're navigating the health system. You just have to know to continue asking questions and not worry about pushing in a respectful way. Yep. Just keep ad advocating for yourself, regardless exactly. of what somebody else might be trying to tell you. Your gut instinct is right. usually right. Well, that's it. And I think that we tend to forget that. And I think that the generation before us, was brought up in a different way of thinking as well as trust your healthcare professionals, they know best. But now, you know, with access to social media and the internet at our hands, we do know a little bit more and it's okay to question. Yeah. I mean, what do we teach our kids? We teach our kids to right? ask questions, to learn, exactly. to be curious. Yep. And then we kind of forget as adults, but there's nothing wrong with continuing to ask questions and learn. Yeah. Yeah. So what advice or little tidbits can you leave our my audience with before we say goodbye? Bits of tidbits. Tidbits. <laughs> In general or? Whatever, um, like, spark you feel. Well, first of all, when you're dealing with body issues and self-esteem, don't let anybody ever make you feel less than. Because... It doesn't take a lot to believe what somebody has to say, but if you can try to keep in your mind that some people just don't have good intentions, you know, it's hard to always keep positive. I heard a lot of negativity about my decisions to remove healthy body parts, but if I dwell on those negative comments, um, it's just going to bring me down. I also personally don't really give a shit about any of those comments because I'm happy with my decision, but not everybody feels like that, you know? Um, well, but and, we should, right? You know, we yeah. should. I mean, what do they always say? Other people's opinions are none of your business. Exactly. And another thing I use this quote, my husband and I heard this quote and we say it all the time is thank God for our own problems. <laughs> keeps keeps things in perspective sometimes, you know? It's like we always compare to... Uh, Oh, well, I can't feel bad because this person has it worse. No, no, no. We all have our own problems. Thank God for our own stuff. We're okay to own it. We're okay to be sad about it. Everybody has their own story to tell. They sure do. And that's yeah. why this podcast is here, to hear right? all the different stories. And sometimes shit happens. <laughs> uh, I'll, I still remember the first time seeing Forrest Gump and he was running and he wiped his face on the and he's like it should happens and he was like right? what and I was like I know. Oh, damn it's so true it's so true yeah it is I mean well, that whole exchange was dead on right and you know life is always going to throw you curveballs nobody knows you know where life is going to take us i never imagined that at 33 that i would undergo a double mastectomy and spend the next eight years going through surgeries and but you know you could either look at it as that sucks what i went through but i just chose to say no i feel really lucky that i have this opportunity so i'm just going to pay it forward there you go and you yeah. you are still paying it forward which is yeah. amazing yeah 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 karen thank you so much for being here and talking with me. I so appreciate it. 
My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I always enjoy talking boobs, tubes, and tattoos. <laughs> T-shirts coming soon. <laughs> exactly. Trademark. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how to deal when the shit gets real, guys. I'll see you all next episode.